Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Full Time Whittle podcast today. I'm delighted to be joined by Wigan MP Lisa Nandy. First and foremost, Lisa, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, okay. Like everyone else, sort of in the middle of a global pandemic, we've been hit by permanent winter um, and we're still talking about how to resolve the issue around Wigan Athletic. But yeah, okay. And I guess I just sort of wanted to say at the outset that thanks so much for doing this, Jay, because... I think a lot of fans have been so anxious over the last few weeks, particularly since the Spanish pulled out and there's been lots of rumours in the media. So I'll do my best today to try and make sure that people feel a bit reassured by what's happening and have a bit more information about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's been it's been a really difficult few weeks since the the Begby trainer administrators announced that the initial Spanish takeover had collapsed. How do you reflect on these last couple of weeks? Um, I mean, I think I think I've said before that it's really frustrating. Um, it, for months now, we'd sort of it. It was sort of in. It was starting to look really inevitable that the Spanish bid would not be able to proceed. There were serious questions that were raised about that bid from a number of parties. The EFL, in my view, is absolutely right to take that seriously and to investigate it. That people have criticised them for taking a lot of time over it. The thing that's difficult is when you're investigating individuals, uh, money, uh, you know, you're often looking right across the world and you're having to do some quite sophisticated investigations, um, digging into bank accounts, into backgrounds. Um, and that that does take a long time. It is a really, really difficult thing to do. And to be fair to the EFL, they do it on, you know, not huge resources. And they were absolutely, I feel confident in saying this, they were absolutely making Wigan a priority, even with everything else going on. Um, and it was frustrating because, you know, a number of us, including the supporters club and myself, had been saying, look, this exclusivity, keeping renewing it is not in the interests of the club. We need to start looking at other bidders. The administrators were reluctant to do that. I'm sure they can defend themselves about that. But it, in my view, we shouldn't have been in a position where we wasted months doing that when we could have moved on and been in a much better position. I think we could have sold the club by now. Nevertheless, having said all of that, that is history. And straight away, as soon as the Spanish said, OK, we're pulling out, we, we sort of got together and said, right, what next? We'd been thinking about a plan B for some time and... We'd, um, I've been talking to lots of the bidders during that process who obviously couldn't talk to the administrators because of exclusivity, but they'd stayed interested. Um, I had a call from the administrators straight after that. They said, We'd, we really, really want to get bidders back in. So if there's anybody that you're talking to, um, please do. I took that as a really positive sign, actually. I think that there, this is much more open now. The, the attitude from the administrators is that they want to work with local partners and they've been talking to the supporters club daily um, throughout all of this. Um, they've been very open with me um, and that's been really, really helpful. So we've got, we're now in a position where there are, it is true um, that there are a number of bidders interested. Some of them don't have the money. I mean, that's been the case all the way through, but some of them are serious, credible people who are obviously doing the background checks to make sure that they're confident about buying the club um, as well as, a process going on where background checks are being done on them to make sure that the administrators and the EFL are confident about it too. So we're, we're making progress. It's 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 a it's a much more optimistic picture than it was a few months ago. How much uh, of uh, of a boost is it that the EFL are willing to look at a number of bids at the same time rather than just one initial bid? Yeah, they've been really. I spoke to them over the weekend. Um, spoke to the administrators as well. Spoke to one of the administrators this morning. Um, and that dialogue is ongoing. Um, I, I think I don't think it's breaking any. Co- I'm not don't, not sure it's in the public domain, but I don't think it's breaking any confidences to say that the administrators are talking to the EFL about the potential bids as they come in. Um, they've provided some information to the EFL so that the EFL can start doing some sort of pre-application checks, um, particularly because there's uh, one bid that at the moment looks like it's the front runner. Um, and the administrators are are treating it as such, although they're, they're dealing with, with the other bidders fairly as well. 
Um, and so that everything that we'd asked for back in September, October, about having a much more open process and ongoing dialogue, getting some of these things done simultaneously, looking at several bids at once, not needlessly entering into exclusivity when you've got lots of bids on the table. All of that, as far as I can see, has been taken on board. Um, and the, when I asked the EFL at the weekend, you know, how much, you know, how, how long will this take? Obviously, they've got to do proper checks. We don't want a, a, a bad owner um, who doesn't have the money or doesn't have Wigan Athletics interests at heart. But they, they, they are giving it priority. They're doing this quickly. They were working over the weekend, um, as were the administrators who were talking to a number of bidders. So um, we, we're getting there. Um, I, I mean, with, as always with this process, never say never say it's resolved until it's actually signed on the dotted line, new owners in the DW, but it's, yeah, we're getting there. Do you feel like the initial offer of exclusivity from the administrators has meant the process has drawn out a little bit longer than it should have done and was therefore a mistake looking back? Um, so, so let me try to be to be fair to them because I have I have been critical and, I, you know, there are, there are things that I will criticise about that. Um, but I guess from their point of view, not offering exclusivity means that you run the risk of bidders pulling out and they that you know we're in a position at the moment where nobody's been offered exclusivity i'm not sure that anyone's requested exclusivity actually i don't think they have at this stage but it you know we may get to a point where uh, you know a front runner says we want exclusivity and that's the decision you know, a decision will have to be made at that point because what you don't want to do is put off good bidders who have put the work in, provided proof of funds, been vetted, um, at least by the admins, have had a past sort of pre-vetting checks by the EFL. You obviously don't want to be in a position where you lose a good bidder for that reason. Um, but I am, I have been very critical of the exclusivity that was granted particularly to the Spanish. I think it may be understandable why the administrators wanted to grant exclusivity to one party at the start. I was a bit surprised it was a Spanish bid, to be honest, because there were several other bids on the table, including one that was higher. Um, so it didn't make a great deal of sense to keep extending it. I think was completely the wrong thing to do. It, it's meant that we've wasted several months when we should have been in a position now where we'd we sold the club and we were looking to the future. But I, I do think it, sound, it seems to me from every conversation I've had with the administrators, the supporters club and others over the last few weeks, that that lesson has been learnt that, um, you know, that, and, and one thing I would say, Jay, as well, is that I've been told by the administrators that the number and the quality of the bids that are on the table now are much higher than they were this uh, it, last summer. Um, now, I don't know why that is, but having spoken to some of the bidders, I think that may be right, actually. Um, uh, th you know, there were good bids put in last summer, but but there are, there are, there are a number of good bidders um, interested, potential investors interested now. It might be because of the vaccine, because people have more confidence that things may start going back to some kind of normal a bit more quickly. It might just be because people have realised that, you know, football club on sale for uh, like Wigan uh, Athletics quality and potential for three, 3.25 million is an absolute bargain. And I think a number of the bidders have recognised that. They've certainly told me that. So, um, w you know, we're kind of, we're in a position now where exclusivity at the, at the moment just doesn't make sense. And I'm glad that the administrators have understood that. Do you think it's quite surprising that some of the bids are better than what they were in the summer, given that we could have a lot less assets than what they did have? Um, I mean, I don't want to over overstate it. There were, I mean, the, the bids last year, there were a number that were a lot higher than they are now. So, you know, if we'd been able to do a deal and I still, for the life of me, cannot understand why some of those bids weren't accepted. If we'd been able to do a deal then, it would have been better for the club because we wouldn't have lost assets, wouldn't have lost good players. Um, and we'd have been able to start turning this around a lot more quickly. It'd been better for the fans, the amount of heart, heartache that has been expended between June and and January is just, you know, it's really hard to watch actually with the, the impact on people's mental health. Um, 
and it would have been better for the administrators because they they would have got their job done they would have been able to go and focus on whatever else it is that they're dealing with the very many things that they are and they would have you know they would have got their fees back and and their costs and so on so i just for the life of me cannot understand why why that didn't happen and I totally understand that there are a lot of people when you go through a process like this who want to buy the club who just don't have the money and you know I wouldn't call them time wasters I think the vast majority of them are people who are trying to raise the money who want to buy the club but I totally understand why the administrators were wary of that but there were definitely people last summer who who had the money who were serious um, who in my view would have been a good good option for us I, I can't understand why that didn't happen nevertheless just to reassure the fans there are there are good credible people now in this process who have the money or very much appear to have the money uh, certainly at least in one case they do and um, so you know we've just got to make sure that that we, we 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 get through the EFL process. We do that right. We do due diligence to make sure the club doesn't end up in a mess after the event. Um, and uh, we, sh you know, I can't put a time scale on it, but I think um, that there is a, there is a sense of urgency around this from all parties now, which is really good news. You've given credit where credit is due in the interview today to the administrators. But how do you think of the, the administrator's conduct throughout the process? Because I know they come under a lot of criticism in the last week or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been pretty crit critical of them as well. Um, I, I mean, my bigger, my bigger problem with all of this is that as somebody who wasn't particularly involved in football before, you know, my the whole the extent of my experience really was just turning up at the DW and either sitting in the stands or going to see the owners in the box and having a chat and watching the football and I've learned on hell of a lot over the last eight months or so about what goes on behind the scenes and about football finance and my bigger issue really is that the administrators are people whose job they're tasked by the former owners to 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 sell the club they've got legal obligations to fulfill but they also they want to make some money out of it I get that but you know this at every stage what I've seen is that the system is set up not to put the fans and the club at the center of things but you know to put other priorities and considerations first and that just you know in a game like football that is just not good enough so you know maybe when this is over I'm sure there'll be plenty to be said about all of that and I'm very determined to say it because I think that people deserve to know what has happened, um, what has been going on behind the scenes. But I just feel at this stage that the administrators are being open. They're trying to get a deal through. They they have you know they have the, they have their own set of priorities. But I have at the moment I have more confidence based on the conversations that I've had with Dean Watson in particular. I have more confidence now than I've had at any stage in this process that 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 they're taking into consideration our concerns to make sure that the long-term future of the club is secured and that you know that's that's positive that's a positive development that's happened in the last couple of months so um you know we've got to keep that going for the good of the, the club absolutely and how close do you feel we're gonna i know you can't put a time scale on it but how close do you think we are to resolution now it, it's been seven months last july uh, I'm sure it feels like a lifetime to yourself, everyone involved, and obviously the fans too, who are the biggest stakeholder in all this. Yeah, so there's a there's a few moving parts going on this week. Um, so the EFL is looking uh, at some of the details around, um, particularly this one bid that I said to you is is being treated as a bit of a front runner. I mean, there are other bids that are being treated seriously as well. So it's not it's not like there's only one one bid on the table. But the EFL is looking at some of that. The administrators are talking to them um, regularly um, and so that you know depending on what happens with that process you may see some movement um, towards a sort of formal bid and a sort of formal vetting process um, but the other thing that's also happening is that there are other bidders coming into the process or already in the process uh, some of whom have I don't think this is breaking any confidence I'll get a phone call from the administrators if it is but you know some of whom are meeting with the council this week, some of whom have, pr have provided proof of funds, some of whom have gone through other parts of the administrator's betting process. There are, there are parties who are credible, who are active in the data room, currently looking at the information um, that is there, um, who may well move this week to put in a formal bid. 
and provide proof of funds as well. So there's, a, there's quite a few moving parts. So it is really difficult to put a time scale on it. I mean, it could be anywhere between sort of, you know, sort of the next couple of weeks and, and the next month. I mean, just depending on how all of that plays out. It could obviously be longer, but I just feel quite... I feel a bit, I, I, I do feel that there's a sense of urgency around it now and nobody really wants to see it drag on for much longer. That's a massive relief to all the fans because I think it's in everyone's best interest to get this solved as soon as possible. And what's the state of play with the DW Stadium and what discussions have been had with the council over this? Um, so do you mean in terms of kind of whether the, the stadium is going to be sold or, um, yeah. Uh, so I think the council's always been, uh, very keen to make sure that the stadium is retained for the use of football and rugby league in the town that you know it's part of the sort of covenant that the the, the council's got that that is the they they have um what you call it they have sway over how that is used so they can uh, they have, which has been really helpful, actually, that they've done that originally when the terms of the contract, would, the legal contracts were drawn up, because it's given them some leverage to make sure that the stadium wasn't sold off to the highest bidder for, you know, housing redevelopment or something else. Um, it depends on it depends on which bid is successful. There are definitely people in the process now who who could afford to and want to buy the whole thing outright. So they'll buy all the assets, including the stadium um, and the squad um and um then the council will retain the stake that they've got in the stadium that's not up for discussion um, which means that they retain the leverage to make sure that in the future it's used for football and rugby league there, there have been other bids on the table over the last few months where um the council um there was some suggestion that you know for example there was a suggestion in the media a while ago that the wigan warriors you know in lenigan might might buy the stadium and then somebody else would own the club and there would be a partnership I think from my point of view it's always been my preferred option that the stadium stays with the football club um that but that they continue to have that partnership with Wigan Warriors so that so that the Warriors can use it um and just to make sure that that is sustainable for both parties so that you know that there have been discussions for example about if one of the buyers comes in and doesn't have enough money to buy the whole thing, could they perhaps up the rent on the stadium? I mean, you know, it's really important for this town that both both Wigan Athletic and Wigan Warriors do well. And so that doesn't seem very sustainable at all. And that's why we've been saying all the way along, it'd be great if we could find somebody who's got enough money, who has the interest of this club at heart, who comes in and just buys the whole thing. I think we probably are in a position where that's more likely than the alternatives now, but, um, you know, it could all fall through. But the, the council, I mean, I don't want to put words in the council's mouth, but the council's, the council's interest has always been to make sure that the Wigan Athletic ha can continue to play in the DW, that Wigan Warriors can continue to use it, and as far as is possible, that, that the club stays as intact as possible. So I think that's been really helpful, actually. They've been they've been incredible at sort of pulling out the stops that, you know, not many councils where you could ring up the, the you know, the the chief exec, the leader of the council or the the head of finance on a weekend. And they just pick up the phone and say, yeah, no problem. I'll do whatever it takes. So, you know, credit credit to them for that. It's really, really good of the council to do that. And, and without naming names, do you in terms of the bids, you mentioned that as a front runner. Are you able to give any indications as to why they are the front runner? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't want to overstate it because, you know, this is all information that I've sort of, uh, you know, I've got the the administrators obviously have to respect confidentiality of, of different parties. And so, you know, they've indicated to me that there is one that they're treating currently as a as a potential front runner. I'm, you know, having talked to a number of those bidders and I'm kind of aware of who, who the key players are. I think there are others actually that are being treated very seriously as well. But it just, it's about who's furthest along in the process, really. You know, there are some parties that have provided proof of funds. There are some parties that haven't and are still in the data room making a determination about whether they, they feel that this is the right right club for them um and they you know they may well come through in the next few days and say yeah we are, we're absolutely serious about this we want to buy it at, at which point they provide proof of, proof of funds they provide id that can be verified 
you know you may find that there's another bidder bidder out there but the key things are really do they have the money that's always been really important lots of people want to buy a football club but most of us I don't know about you but I don't have three three million quid down the back of the sofa um so that's the first thing do they have the money secondly like are they serious you know have they have have they progressed with all the checks um provided the information that the administrators need there's quite a few tests you have to get through um some to do with money laundering some to do with um just verifying the identification of the people who are involved um so some of them have done that some of them haven't um there's also um you know there's other things like have they talked to interested part you know the supporters club for example i always take it as a good sign if they want to talk to the supporters club and those lots of the bidders through this process have wanted to keep their identities a secret until they're further along in the process so that's completely fine but if they want to talk to local partners i tend to think that is a sign that they're serious and that they want to build, build good strong local relationships so that i think that's what where the administrators are definitely coming from is that the reason that a potential front runner has emerged is because there is a party that's that's got that far but there are other parties who've got pretty far along in that process as well so that's that's good news have you had any personal conversations with any interested parties and if so how do you feel about that yeah a few um uh um i'm trying to be really it sounds like i'm being really cagey i am a bit but it's only because i don't want to give away the identities of any people who don't want to be in the public domain at the moment just want to say to the fans that the reason a lot of the bidders don't want to be in the public domain uh, initially is because a lot of the debate around ownership gets very very sort of tense um very quickly and I, I think you know a lot of the bidders have watched the way that the the debate particularly on social media has become very angry uh very very fast and lots of people you know lots of bidders have been attacked and um you know their reputations sort of questioned i'm i'm not in any sense saying that the fans shouldn't have a view of course they definitely should and they have a right to but i think a lot of the bidders are just a bit wary of stepping into that and that public domain and making the public case to the fans that they should be the new owners before they've you know that before they've got through those initial checks like proof of funds like um id vetting and so on and i really i respect that and i don't want to put any good bidders off and some of these people are i can i can absolutely vouch for that i think supporters club too that some of these people are good people who you know who, who have a genuine interest in the football club so if i'm sounding a little bit like i'm sort of you know being careful about what i say that's the reason i just do not want to put good bid bidders off um and cost the football club that but yes i have had conversations with people um it's been um mainly positive you know obviously my job is not just to make friends with the new owners potential owners my job is to make sure that these are good people who have the interests of the club at heart and that we don't end up in a situation like we did last june um so you know as with the spanish i asked very tough questions of the spanish about their background their links about tax about other issues and you know i've been having those conversations with some of the bidders as well it's um it's mostly reassuring i have got some concerns i i, I will have some concerns i don't want to unduly alarm the fans about that but that's my job right and then i flag them with the efl i flag them with the administrators um and ask them to do proper investigations into that we i know that it's really frustrating for the fans i know everybody just wants an owner but i think most people do understand that we don't just want an owner we want an owner that is going to be good for the club so um you know any any concerns that i've come across particularly in the last couple of weeks i've been flagging constantly with the efl i think they're sick of hearing of from me but um that they've been lovely that you know they, they they see this as a really important part of the process is that the local council the supporters club myself you know we're important channels to to make sure that we raise those concerns and that they look into them so so that's basically the process that we've been going through over the last couple of weeks to offer a bit of a counter argument i know you mentioned the fans how when the when a bit bidder circulates online they do ask questions but can you understand why they ask questions given what happened last july and why they will be concerned definitely i mean I, and, and i think this is a consequence of you know i feel that bad decisions have been made at various stages of this process and the fans have more of a stake in this than anybody so 
there is no question at all that the fans should be asking those questions. They should, they absolutely should. But it's got some of the, it's not just, it's not just around Wigan Athletic. I mean, the online debate sort of, you know, any sort of social media debate seems to go from naught to 60 in five seconds flat. And, you know, I've been a bit concerned about some of the ways, I mean, anyone who gets involved in this debate gets pulled into it and starts getting attacked. Lots of the fans groups have been out saying, look, can we just stop doing this because it's not helpful? I think it's only a small minority of people, but it is very difficult. I was a bit concerned about the way some of the local reporters were being treated over the last couple of weeks. I know that they've been around, you know, and they can take care of themselves. But, uh, you know, from my point of view, the Wigan Evening Post has been phenomenal at covering this. That, you know, they'll, they'll cover real information. They'll put it out into the public domain. They never shy away from telling the truth on this. But they also, they want the club to do well. So if they're asked to respect confidentiality because a bidder might pull out, they will take that into consideration. You know, they're trying to get as much information in front of the fans as they possibly can without, you know, and they've been really savvy as well, because throughout this process, we have had potential investors who've been trying to sort of spin the media coverage in their favour. There was one in particular where I had to say to the local paper, they're claiming that I've endorsed them and that the council's endorsed them. I've literally never met these people and I have no intention of endorsing them. So they've been really good at getting that information out into the public domain. And I just, you know, for the, for the fans, it's just been the most frustrating experience. I can see why the debate gets very angry and heated, but I can also see why, because of that, some of the bidders just want to keep their identities under wraps until they've got far enough along in the process that they can go out and make that case to the fans. So, um, just got it. We, you know, mo most, I, I just think most of us in this process sort of understand all the complexities of it. The fans certainly have been brilliant at doing that. And, um, and calming the debate down when it needs to be but um it's just yeah, i don't know it's just one of the most frustrating things i've ever been involved with to be honest uh, you can i just i want to sort of say to you right look here's a list of all the bidders here's who they are here's what we think but it just wouldn't help the club so um you know we can we can have a much more honest conversation i think once we've we've, we've got got some of this into the public domain well, well on, on the conversation of fans uh, have you been actively working on the plan b and uh, with the supports funds and, and if so at what stage will it make sense to push forward with this? So this is still very much alive um, we have no intention of letting it go because one thing I've learned in the last eight months is that you can think you're there and then you're not there at all because the whole thing falls apart and that's happened on a number of occasions some of which has happened publicly but some of which has just happened privately behind the scenes and so we'd always been committed to making sure that we, there is a, a safety net so that this club is not allowed to fail. Um, but it, the, the, the difficulty that the supporters club have is that, you know, they don't just have to raise the money to buy the club. They have to raise the money for two seasons um, to pass the EFL test. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at in terms of satisfying those requirements is somewhere between six and seven million depending on who you talk to now you know we raised huge amounts of money it was phenomenal the way that the fans stepped forward but we haven't got six or seven million the council's been enormously helpful um but that you know there is still a shortfall and so we're, we're still very much working on on that that proposal to make sure that it doesn't, you know, that there is an option there if necessary. But, you know, if you fall sh short of that, the other the other problem is, of course, that you could end up with the 15 point deduction and relegated. Um, you know, if the, if the alternative is no club or being relegated, of course, we'd all take being relegated. But I think at this stage, there's reason to believe that we can do better than that for Wigan Athletic. So it's still there. And the other, the other option, of course, with the supporters club money is if it's, not used it gets returned to the fans who donated it but if it there is also obviously the prospect at some point that they could go into partnership with another another potential bidder um that couldn't make it viable or didn't want to make it viable on their own so we're keeping all those options alive definitely that's really good to hear and in your own personal opinion now what would be the perfect ownership model for Wigan athletic Wigan warriors and the council um I mean, so what I would love to see is an, an ownership model that was a partnership between the supporters club, the fans, 
um, and a local investor. I think, you know, when we've been talking to a lot of football clubs who, where they've had a fan only ownership model, sometimes it's been really positive, but one thing they have really struggled with is that, you know, particularly for a league one club, um, you need constant investment and that could be very difficult to raise if it's a fan only ownership model. But having the fans at the centre of the club and driving the direction of the club feels to me like that just would be an absolute dream. So if we could find a, a local investor who, who just, you know, really had the interest of the club at heart, who could work with the supporters club, that would be incredible. But I had a conversation with uh, someone this weekend who said to me, well, you know, you know, I've got my own version of the ideal owner as well, but the trouble is in football, that just doesn't really exist. And that, that for me, just points to a bigger problem with, with the model that we've got in football, where League One clubs, League Two clubs, Championship clubs just do not have the finance unless you can find a wealthy owner who's prepared to put a lot of money in. And that, that model, everybody recognises, is just completely unsustainable and puts the fans last rather than the fans first. So we've got to, we've got to make sure this changes. But in the meantime, you know, obviously the club, saving the club is the priority. So just got to get some, uh, you know, good if there's a good bidder around and they don't meet our ideal criteria, we've just got to be realistic about that. Do you think it could be possible for Parliament and the government to drive changes in football in terms of sustainability, in terms of helping clubs survive in the future? Because obviously with the pandemic, the lack of income from fans has been a real killer. Yeah, I think the pandemic has shown too, though, that when um, when when football the football world wants to come together, it can. You know, you've seen an agreement to get Premier League money to um, lower league clubs. I'm not saying that's been easy. It's been really, really difficult to get that level of agreement, but it shows that it is possible um, if you know the future of the game is threatened. I think my message to the Premier League clubs will be that you need to recognise that a lot of these lower league clubs are why you end up with good players. You know, we're the sort of feeding ground for, um, for, for really good young talent. And this is about investing in Britain as well and investing in British people, like young people from places like Wigan. If they're going to get an opportunity to go and play and to, 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 to become the sort of players of the future, it's going to be through clubs like Wigan Athletic that they do it. So we've got to flip this pyramid where it's like an inverted pyramid where all the money is at the top and it gets less and less as you go towards the bottom. Somebody said to me really early on in this process that, um, the, the big the big problem as well for championship clubs and one of the reasons that Wigan Athletic, you know, the, 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 the Hong Kong owners weren't keen on just continuing to invest is that in the championship, you know, in the Premier League, you have a lot of you have big money, uh, big income, but you also have big costs in the, the lower leagues, particularly sort of League Two, you have very little income, but you, you have less costs. But in the championship, you have um, big costs but not enough money and so it makes it virtually impossible to break the dominance of the clubs at the top and to see any real movement um, and then there just isn't an interest for those clubs to be able to, um, to 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 support others we have seen examples of that I'm not claiming for a minute that we haven't but it just it's not sustainable and for a lot of towns around this country you know a lot of those big clubs are based in the big cities that have been booming for years but for our towns this is just a really really big problem and so could could government and parliament fix it yeah absolutely I and mean, parliament the, the select committee produced a report several years ago outlining what should change the government is saying it wants a fan-led review i very much support that but it is absolutely crystal clear that they're hiding behind this forthcoming review, which is never forthcoming, to stop, you know, to not actually take on some of those vested interests and to get this resolved. Um, when I speak to people privately, whichever footballing body or uh, part of the footballing world they're in, everybody accepts this, but still nothing is done about it. And it's just really, really frustrating. Hopefully in the future, there can be changes made to this. And uh, it's safe to say over the last couple of weeks, to say you've been busy will be a massive understatement with the situation at Wigan Athletic, your role as a shadow foreign secretary. How do you prioritise these demands made of you? And, and how do you cope with the threats of such plate spinning? Sorry, uh, I'm quite... cold as well. <laughs> yeah, no, um, badly is probably the answer. Um, I'm, I'm homeschooling as well at the moment, which is um, a little bit of a challenge. 
Um, I guess, you know, I mean, I've got an amazing team. My Wigan team is incredible. So my office manager, I've got a senior caseworker, they just, you know, they're working flat out all week, just picking up the phone, trying to resolve people's problems, pe businesses looking for loans or grants, you know, people being furloughed. There's all sorts of things going on um, at the moment. But I just, I guess that's kind of the, the great thing about the job is that although there are times when it's just totally overwhelming, we can help people. And I just feel like Wigan Athletic is one of those things where this just matters so much to the town as well as to the fans. You know, it matters to the footballing world too. If Wigan Athletic is allowed to fail a good club like Wigan Athletic, then this can happen to anyone and we just cannot allow this to happen. So I just feel like this is one of those things like where it's a real privilege actually to be able to play a part in resolving it. I'd you know going back to that conversation we were having about the fans a little bit earlier I think one of the things I talked to some of the fans you know obviously I know, I know a lot of football fans but I talk to them regularly and I think one of the things that's really frustrating is when you're sitting on the outside and you're powerless to actually exert any leverage or get change and I think that's what accounts for a lot of the frustration I completely understand that and I think you know I've been watching some of the people like Jonathan Jackson and you know, the chair of the supporters club and how hard they've been working and the amount of stress that they're under in trying to resolve this. But I think what we all feel is that it is a privilege to be able to, to be in a position where we can step up. And over the last year, I think collectively, we've stopped some bad decisions from being made and we've, we've inched things forward. And we've made sure through the, the, the plan B option that there just isn't an option for this club to... To, to fall apart and you know we none of us are going to be celebrating until this is sorted but it, it's a privilege to be in that position and I, I you know so thank it's really nice to see how you always check in and say how you doing but I just wanted to reflect that as well because I recognize for a lot of the fans that's a lot of what is so frustrating about all of this and as soon as this is over we can have a really open conversation about everything that needs to change and that we've learned from all of this and I hope you'll perhaps you'll host us all on your podcast to be able to do it. Absolutely I think that's a lovely way to sum things up because I think in in 10 years 20 years time this will be part of history now and you have that opportunity to kind of change things and obviously make an impact in the survival of the football club and I always like to check up on how you're doing because I'm a big advocate of, of mental health and looking out for each other and I think during these times the tensions are so high at the moment and understandably so football is a lot of people's livelihoods it's what they live for it's what they, they work nine to five for every week and look forward to on the Saturday so you can understand how much it means to everyone it means a lot to myself and it means a lot to yourself as well and everyone involved and I think the final question as, as always I always like to end it on What'll be your direct message to Wigan Athletic supporters? I mean, I just want to, I just want to thank thank people really because for you know for for sort of sticking with this, for stepping forward when whenever they've been asked, people have just come forward to do all sorts of things. Not just the money, although the, you know the amount that was raised was huge, but also you know people like the work that you've been doing, Jay, and others in setting up mental health support groups and you know, doing podcasts to get information out to people. I've watched a lot of this happening. And, you know, when things have got particularly tense online, there've been a lot of people saying, come on, calm down. We've got to work together and, 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 and find a resolution to this. It's usually been the fans leading that charge. There's also, you know, the, I don't know if I've ever said this to you, but I, I wrote to, to Jonathan Jackson um, when the, um, that Al Young sort of takeover was in the offing to say, I'm really concerned about some information that's come into my possession about the potential for, for some, a transfer of ownership for Wigan Athletic. And I, I think he was very, you know, he was very aware of, of that and had been very proactive about, about that as well. Uh, but I wrote to him at the time because that information had come into my possession via a fan who had been doing some digging into what was happening at the club and had said to me, there's something about this proposed ownership model that doesn't stack up. And that was what enabled me to flag concerns. And Jonathan was obviously flagging his own concerns. You know, we can go into the whole history of all of that at some point in the future, but it was a fan who did that. And that's because in the end, the fans 
are the most passionate people about the future of the club and can be just the essential link to making sure that the club survives. So I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that really and to say thank you to people for everything that they've been doing. And just to say, you know, never, never, you know, never, I'll never make promises that I can't keep. But although this is frustrating, I do feel that there is progress being made, that there are options, that we should be in a position to, to get this resolved in the very near future. So, you know, keep, keep going, keep the faith, um, believe, and we'll get there. Absolutely. It's a great way. I think I said to end the podcast, but with that question, I know you mentioned uh, our young uh, like hire there. Do you still support the investigation into what happened at League Athletic after this process has long gone? Yeah, and actually the EFL has been, has that investigation that they promised is ongoing as well. So just to reassure fans that that hasn't been forgotten about, that there is still uh, work happening right now and there is an intention to step that up to make sure that we get answers about what happened not just for us but for all football fans to make sure this never happens to anyone again so that that is still there but I think people will understand that our absolute overriding priority at the moment is to secure the long-term future of the club and that's that's what we're sort of busting a gut to do. Absolutely and I'd just like to say a massive thank you on, on behalf of the the fans uh, I know we, I've had a lot of kind messages when they were told that you were coming on the podcast. So thank you for the effort you put in and the hard miles you've done. So fingers crossed the next time you'll come on this podcast, we'll have some good news and be talking about the resolution of Wig Athletic. That'd be amazing. Thanks, Jay.